This is Jim McAndrew for Camera 3. We present today a conversation between R.D. Lang and Joseph Chaikin. This unusual dialogue was recorded in our studios on the occasion of a recent visit to this country by Dr. Lang. In its original form, it lasted an hour and a half. We've edited ex excerpts together. The edit points will be clear in the program, but have kept the material in its original sequence. The controversy surrounding Scottish-born psychiatrist R.D. Lang has increased sharply in recent years. His books, such as The Divided Self and The Politics of the Family, have contested orthodox approaches to mental illness and have forced in our times a new way of thinking about sanity and madness. Many thousands have now seen the film Asylum, which depicts aspects of life in Lang's rehabilitation center in England. And many have heard his lectures on the usefulness of acting out personality disturbances and the idea that schizophrenia is a normal protective reaction to a hostile world. Joe Chaikin is the founder and guiding spirit of the highly experimental Open Theatre Group, which has challenged many assumptions about the stage and the audience with such successful productions as America Hurrah, The Serpent, and Terminal. Chaikin was born in Brooklyn, grew up in Iowa, and has received several awards for outstanding performances as an actor off-Broadway. As the director of Open Theatre and author of The Presence of the Actor, Hanging, He's now regarded as a central around. influence in the course of modern theater. Lang and Chaikin are longtime I friends, and both are vitally concerned with nonverbal communication. Their dialogue began with nothing less than making faces. I feel like a lot of people. And faces, of course, that's the that's, uh, thing I love to do with people, just making faces at each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm Try to make me smile. How can you make the face you make? My professional face. Yes. <laughs> Would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so his face that expresses deep sincere <laughs> concern. <laughs> that you do is more convincing. Mm. There. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> the face of my mother, you know, when I was uh, eight years old, my um, father, I was an only child, my uh, father gave my mother uh, the only birthday present I 
remember him even, ever having given it, which uh, you know, was very sweet. He came home from his office, and this time he had remembered. He brought a little uh, box, nicely wrapped up, and uh, uh, I was standing there. My mother was sitting. She had a father gave her. Mm -hmm. And she undid it. Um, he remembered her birthday. And he, he, she opened it and it was of cotton wool, and inside it was another little box. And she got her and opened it, and uh, inside that it was um, a set of, uh, a complete set of uh, ten of his uh, toe nail <laughs> clippings. <laughs> <laughs> and it, well, it wasn't as though there was anything else <laughs> to come. That was it. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, How did she responded. She never said a word. Did she? Try to indicate a response as though she was. It was her face that. Um, I don't know whether I can do it, but it's printed in my memory. Never. Yeah. I get clogged up mm -hmm. here very easily. Uh, of, um, the tears that um, sort of, uh, you know, being a boy, you're not supposed to cry. So um, one pulls the tears back from the eye. And the eyes are get quite dry. Yeah. And uh, they start to accumulate around the sinuses and then the nose up here when one develops sinusitis. And <coughs> one starts to choke it off up here and one develops tonsillitis. <laughs> and uh, one stops it sort of hurting here and puts one's diaphragm into spasm and gets um, <coughs> pretty tough, you know. Uh, one starts to really get asthma, which um, Wheezy in the winter time, bronchitis. <sighs> when I was a boy, I thought that I was going to start life later, that being a boy was about. Uh, uh, some kind of, uh, like one was a... Uh, dry run. Dry run, yeah. <clears throat> Didn't count. It was all just uh, 
hanging, hanging around. And then later, I kept saying to myself, uh, at what point does it actually start? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there a clear signal? Um. I feel like a lot of people uh, say at different points, not necessarily that, but they say, is this it? Mm-hmm. Is this it, or is mm-hmm. it... Uh, or is it something? I feel particularly here, for example, there's a sense of a kind of promise that has not yet quite been fulfilled. I mean, just this very moment. This, no, 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 not in this moment. No, no. No, I was thinking of this yeah. country. Oh, this country, yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. A land this of country, promise. yeah. I it, have it, promises it, to keep for many miles to go before I sleep. Yeah. Time <coughs> completely baffles me. I don't understand it at all. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is. I don't know how it is. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what I'm doing in it. Or whether I can, one can say that even. Have you, um, one of the subjects that, uh, sometimes I think I've spent uh, an inordinate amount of time uh, pondering upon uh, is, um, how I would uh, feel uh, if I'm compass mentis. When what it's happening, what does that mean? if I if I'm uh, if my uh, if my mind is intact, as it were, uh, while it's uh, happening, uh, in the actual at the actual time when I take the last breath that I'm ever going to take in this body. Yeah. No, there it is, one breathes, and then there isn't another breath. That's the last one. Would I be frightened? Would I be released from this uh, veil of tears or life? lose the illusion that there's any eye at all and fade out into an ineffable voidness that's void of voidness as they say. Will I confront the the judge of the quick and the dead? What does that mean? I think a lot of people do what I've done from time to time and still sometimes do, which is look for rules to live by, particular rules to go by, Mm. so that uh, one has um, some sense of um, a particular landscape. You mean the adoption of some, um, what is often referred to as some um, mental discipline or spiritual yeah. path? Mm-hmm. Or yeah. When I was in uh, Kashmir, I um, went along to see uh, a Muslim saint in those parts who was... Um, reputed to be over a hundred years old. He was a just like a bird, a very tiny little 
man with uh, quick moving clear eyes and uh, not like that I mean he wasn't sort of looking out in any sort of startled way but he's in a white uh, you know, beard and here and uh, I didn't speak a word of English but um, he um, uh, had a couple of people translating for him and uh, He asked me why I'd come to see him, and uh, I replied that um, I was seeking for the correct way to live. And uh, his reply was, let your heart be pure like the sun love everything that is the correct way to live hmm. I, so I don't know whether that one <sighs> love everything Do you think that's something that he said to you, or that that's something he would say to anybody who asked him that? I have no idea. Because I was putting myself in your place and thinking that if he said that to me, I, uh, an automatic resistance would come up and say, I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't love everything. Mm. And then... Uh, And uh, one might even uh, go further and say, why should one? Sometimes I feel deprived of, uh, of not having a tradition that I can, uh, without question accept, that I can say, I, I accept that, I, I really accept that. I Were you brought up with a tradition? I mean, as... Uh, well, a little bit, but um, I mean, I was brought up Jewish, and my tradition was uh, that I was to love God no matter what happened. Mm. And if, if at any point I didn't love him, I was to simulate that I loved him. Mm. And that uh, that was the tradition in terms of God. Who was God in those days? God was the, the menacing force that punished all of us. Did he forgive as well? He didn't forgive. It, sometimes he overlooked. He just was busy punishing elsewhere. <laughs> oh, that's right. He didn't pay any attention. But mm -hmm. now his main uh, function was to, to was as a vindictive force. Mm -hmm. What was he? What did he mainly um, uh, punish uh, people for, for not loving him? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. If you loved him enough, it was likely that your punishment would be less severe, or that you would care less about it. Mm. But um, yeah. Did did uh, could he uh, and did he was he watching you all the time? Yeah, except when he was distracted <laughs> with other people <laughs> or somebody else. Otherwise, he was. Did watching, you ever feel yeah. sorry for him, uh, having to do all that? Um, but my sense of him was that he was inexhaustible, enjoying himself too much. That he that, that um, my sense of him was that he couldn't. I mean, that he was tireless. That he never stopped doing all these <laughs> rotten things. <laughs> Uh, I was talking to a girl in a New York uh, office uh, this afternoon, and she asked me what um, said you've uh, he have been 
to the east and uh, you've been to uh, India and what did you do there? And I said, I did nothing. And uh, she said, oh, I see that you don't want to answer that question. I'm sorry I asked. And uh, I said, oh, actually, I w wasn't putting over anything on you that uh, as far as uh, um, pretty well, that's the simplest and most honest uh, answer that took me a little while to get round to it, but I eventually really did manage more or less to do nothing at all. I didn't think, I didn't read, I didn't write, I spent uh, whole days not saying a word to anyone um, and uh, uh, no one was saying anything to me either. Uh, I wasn't worrying, I wasn't uh, uh, thinking about the future or remembering the past. Uh, I wasn't uh, doing any yoga particularly, I wasn't um, uh, taking exercise, uh, I wasn't uh, being lazy, I was just hanging out. And she said, uh, I can't, uh, it's, I can't understand that at all, I don't, don't understand that. Uh, I, I, one of the difficulties about talking about this uh, or uh, many other things is that uh, as soon as one says anything, people think that one's making a prescription for what they ought to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they the sort of... Um, um, if, if, if you see if, uh, for instance, at the moment, I'm not uh, eating uh, meat or fish... And uh, practically every meal I've had in, uh, since I've been over uh, in New York, though I, uh, I may say not so much in uh, Britain and not at all in uh, India, someone will, will s make some remark about why aren't you eating meat? Yeah. And, um, um, uh, or it, you know, it really makes me nervous, why don't you eat meat? Uh, 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 when I've, uh, and uh, people say, um, well, uh, uh, if you don't eat meat, why don't you uh, not eat uh, vegetables? Uh, they're um, yeah. uh, living as well. And I, I'm saying, well, I'm not making anything out of it. I, I don't have to explain myself. I don't even know really why I'm not eating meat. I just, I, I'm not making a number out of it, or an ideology out of it, or a dogma out of it. I'm not prescribing non-eating of meat to anyone else. I've enjoyed a lot of meat in my time, and may do in the future time. But as of now, I don't actually feel like eating uh, meat. And it's such a hassle, so much of uh, that sort of thing, if one allows oneself to get hassled of having to explain oneself if one does anything that's slightly not what uh, most people are doing. Yeah. And letting one's face move, that's another thing. I, um, you know, how often I remember in my life being told by people who were sort of close to me or my wife or something, something uh, um, my... <coughs> Um, you know, tr try and watch tr uh, your face. Don't, um, you know, um, make these facial yeah. expressions. Don't turn your eyes up. Don't flutter your eyelids. Uh, uh, don't uh, do that sort of stuff that you do with your m uh, mouth. Uh, don't show your teeth in the way you do. There's nothing sort of uh, look at. If you do that sort of thing, people think you're crazy. Yeah. You know, compose yourself, yeah. and uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's perfectly easy to do it, but ah, um, oh, I can't be bothered. There's a there's a chap in London who uh, I've uh, sent people to. As he seems to have a real flair for working with the voice, uh, and. Uh, the way he puts it in terms of theory that, uh, what he, that what he does is that uh, very few people have uh, found their true voice. They have some false voice. It's uh, 
you know, like it's, it's a voice mask, as it were, it's a false voice that uh, expresses in, in voice terms a, a false, uh, the false self or uh, system and so on. And that, um, so he works with people uh, individually in groups and uh, he, uh, uh, he adapts his uh, tactics to each individual person with a view to um, uh, fi coaxing or finally evoking from them uh, that voice, which is their voice, which always yeah. comes from the deeper in the body, deep, yeah. uh, from the from the heart and the and the guts, and uh, yeah. so on. I suppose that one of the things that um, I can't help feeling somewhat uh, when I'm sad about that. Um, so many people never uh, allow themselves uh, out of uh, whatever considerations uh, uh, take precedence. The sort of fear, I suppose, that I if they let go, they would run amok or uh, be violent or and uh, lose control of themselves in some uh, damaging uh, way, etc., etc. And, and I also respect that uh, anxiety and. Uh, some people do seem to, many people do feel that they're sitting on top of a volcano within them. And, uh, I mean, that's where true, the true physician or therapist and the art of true therapy comes in that, uh, all right, we all got different parts to play and some, a part that some people can do as a contribution to the common wheel is is to be a medium f f the f for in terms of uh, a, a relationship with whom some people can um, um, find themselves more. Yeah. Though I really find it increasingly uh, more. Um, difficult to, to to put this sort of theoretical construction on these matters because it um, uh, all sort of sounds to me so um, much rather just get on with it and talk about it. <laughs>